Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Dr. Allison Blakely, professor of European and Comparative History and the George and Joyce Wine Professor of American, African American Studies at Boston University. Blakely graduated with honors from the University of Oregon in 1962 with a BA in U.S. History. He was one of 11 graduates of the UO Honors College, which was created in 1960. Blakely went on to earn a PhD in Modern European and Russian History from UC Berkeley in 1971. His interest in comparative history has centered on comparative populism and on the historical evolution of color prejudice. He is currently working on an overview of the history of blacks in modern Europe. Blakely is the author of Blacks in the Dutch World, the Evolution of Racial, I beg your pardon, the Evolution of Racial Imagery in a Modern Society from 1994, and the author of Russia and the Negro, Blacks in Russian History and Thought, 1986, which won an American Book Award. National president of Phi Beta Kappa from 2006 to 2009, Blakely represented the Honor Society at the investiture of UO President Richard LaRiviere on May 21, 2010. On November 3, 2010, Blakely was presented with the Robert D. Clark Honors College's 2010 Alumni Achievement Award. The following day, he gave a lecture entitled, Black European Responses to the Election of Barack Obama. Allison, welcome to our program. Thank you. We're so pleased that we get to talk to you while you're on campus. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I understand from our conversation before we started taping that it's not all that often that you find your way back to U of O. Is that true? It's not, but, but not for lack of wanting to. It's, it's, it's just that I've been on the East Coast now for 40 years, and I just don't always make it back to my favorite places on the West Coast. It is a long trip back, and I know you have family in the area, and that's actually where I'd like to start, is your yes. roots in Portland and your, your upbringing in Portland. Can you tell us a little bit about how those, that experience of growing up in the Pacific Northwest perhaps influenced your choice of career and of research topic? I think it did. Uh, I started out on a former plantation way out in the country in Alabama. And uh, my mother and uh, an older sister and I moved to Portland in 1946 when I was six years old, just in time for me to start my education uh, in the Portland public schools. And in fact, I completed all of my education up to graduate school in Oregon. Uh, first in Portland, then in, sh can I mention Corvallis? Yes, you <laughs> We are very broad-minded I, I thought I wanted to be an engineer because I was going to help catch up with the Russians. You see, in my junior year, uh, Sputnik went up, and we thought we were behind at that, that point, and that was sort of uh, idealistic. And at the same time, I was very conscious of the, of the Cold War and, and, and all of that discussion. And it aroused my curiosity about Russia. And meanwhile, I'd uh, fallen in love with uh, Russian literature and wanted to uh, read it in the original. So the very first year that Russian language was offered in uh, Portland Public Schools in high school, uh, I enrolled in a, in a Russian language course as a freshman uh, at Jefferson High School. And this just further whetted my appetite for uh, getting further into this kind of subject matter, which, as you might imagine, wasn't really just natural based on um, my origins and, and, and my family background. Uh, but that fascination is something that, that's, uh, that's never left me. And overall, my, my experience in Portland uh, made an impression on me that has uh, led to Portland still being my favorite city in the world, even though I've traveled on all the continents and, 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 and been in a lot of different uh, places. I also uh, go back to Portland often because uh, some of my very closest and dearest friends are, are still there. And, and it's almost like the, the case where you just pick up the conversation that you left off however many <laughs> years ago because we were so close then, you know, uh, in those uh, days, uh, segregation was, was pretty uh, firmly in place. 
all over the country, and I grew up in the Albina district of Portland, and there were about 15,000 black people in Oregon in the 1940s, 1950s, and we almost all knew each other, <laughs> almost literally, simply because uh, we lived within a couple of miles of each other, usually, because although the Albina district wasn't totally segregated, uh, that's where most of the black population was uh, located. So we went to the same schools, the same churches, and uh, had uh, different family networks and so forth. So even though I've been away from Oregon for 50 years, I still feel like Oregon is home when I think about where home is. And I've lived in uh, Washington, D.C. area now for 40 years, and now Boston for the last 10 of those. For the last 10 years, I've been living in two cities because uh, we're still based in, in Washington as well. But Portland uh, just has a special meaning for me, and looking back, I have appreciated the education that I received in the Portland Public Schools even more because uh, looking at the developments in, in public education, I can appreciate the high quality that, that we had. In grade school, we moved from class to class with uh, instructors who were specialists in different uh, areas. And this is something they only came back to in, you know, in recent years in, in some places. And then uh, Jefferson High School, too, had some outstanding uh, teachers. The year that uh, Martha Schull, who was the first uh, woman president of the uh, National Education Association, uh, assumed that role. She was teaching me at uh, Jefferson High School, and I, I think she had a, something like a 50-year teaching career at, at Jefferson. And it was that, that caliber of, uh, of individual and, and, and teacher, I think, that uh, shaped my impression of what I was getting, and then uh, it stood me in good stead. Clearly, yeah. yeah. You've, we can be very proud of you as an Oregonian, as a product of the Oregon education system. I wish we were still offering Russian in high school. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the regrettable thing is, it's almost inconceivable, but universities are beginning to close Russian departments. Just at the time when Russian language <laughs> would actually be more valuable, because the strictures of the Soviet regime made it very difficult for uh, very many different types of use to be made of that. And that's still a very important part of the world. Yeah. And so it's just inconceivable to me that because of something like, uh, understandably, the bottom line uh, is putting pressures that they would cut back on vital foreign language training. You actually anticipated one of my questions, but I'd like to explore this a little bit further with you. You've been nominated by President Obama to serve as a member of the National Council on the Humanities, I believe. Is that That's correct? That's correct, yeah. So in that position, you're going to be asked to comment on and think about things like the recent cuts at SUNY Albany, which has cut almost all of its foreign language programs, in fact, almost all of its humanities programs. What is your response to the, the diminishing of humanities departments in universities and colleges these days? Well, I, I think it's, it's tragic because if you consider the, the way the world is going in the 21st century, and you think about what the humanities are, you look at the importance of cultural diversity, the importance of different peoples being able to communicate with each other and to understand each other, it's more vital now than ever before for the future of the world. And in, in terms of the role of the United States, if we truly want to be world leaders, we have to place a great emphasis on education in an era where communication may be the most important industry of all, if you look at all the different uh, facets of that. Uh, notion. I mean, I'm talking about the internet, I'm talking about uh, everything you can conceive of, and it, it's not coal miners anymore, like I, I had a great uncle that I lived with for th three years who was a coal miner. That's, that's not the wave of the future. It's a different kind of, 
of uh, industry, different kind of labor, and we've got to put more emphasis on education. If you consider the fact that not only the United States, but other leading Western societies are now importing most of their science personnel from Asia, that doesn't coincide very well with the notion that we want to be the leaders of the world. And you couple that with the fact that now we're in such heavy debt to China <laughs> Uh, that doesn't bode well for the future in terms of the notion of American leadership. So I really do think that uh, edu education plays such a, a crucial role that it has to get a higher priority. I understand a senator uh, elected uh, yesterday wants to dismantle the Department of Education. Is this the time to dismantle that kind of emphasis on the importance of education. Just the fact that there's enough public support for that kind of thinking, it's, it's really frightening to me, to tell the truth. I'm glad we're going to have you as a spokesperson on the National Council for the Humanities. Of well, course, with it, me, wait, you're preaching wait to a minute, the converted, I, I, but, <laughs> oh, yes, I, go I, ahead. I want to, uh, to correct one thing. I'm not yet appointed <laughs> and maybe Fair I should enough. maybe I should retract the last <laughs> statement I made because <laughs> my fate rests with a committee in the Senate <laughs> at, this, at this moment. I'll tell you what, we'll hold the interview <laughs> until after the nomination process okay. has, has come to an end. Yeah, yeah you're right, I was, I was a little premature with that. I hope we will have you as a spokesperson <laughs> on the National Council for the Humanities because you're very eloquent about not only the, the, the philosophical need to continue um, to educate our students to be world citizens and to communicate, but also that there's an economic factor in here. Of course. Dealing with this, doing this because of budget crises is perhaps um, shooting oneself in the foot in the long term Precisely. for our, the yes. health of our economy. I'd like to go back, if you don't mind, Allison, to your own experience. I'm wondering specifically about what it was like to be in one of the first graduating classes of the Clark Honors College. Can you talk about what that experience was like to be within that program within the larger university? Did you have an awareness that you were part of a special cohort of students? Like so many experiences we have as we're going through life, we don't really grasp uh, the significance of uh, th some of the, the very uh, most important while we're experiencing it because we, we can't appreciate the, the context nor uh, the, the future uh, manifestations of that. So I can't honestly say that I viewed myself as a pioneer or as uh, experiencing something really unique. I was, I was very happy to be able to participate in, in the classes in, in the honors uh, program because uh, they were uh, so stimulating and, and uh, rewarding for me. But in high school, I was in what was called educational enrichment. And so I was already accustomed to being challenged and to being uh, in a classroom with other people who had the same kind of hunger for exploring uh, in, in various uh, directions. So it wasn't a, a totally uh, unique experience for me. But I think that, uh, again, looking back, that it, it was very important for me that I could have uh, that kind of, of setting as opposed to just the standard uh, kind of uh, program aimed at just getting you through uh, college with a degree. I really did have the feeling that I was being asked to reflect and to think deeply. And I think uh, that's contributed uh, very favorably to my success in later life as a teacher. And in fact, for three years, I directed an honors program at uh, Howard University where I taught for 30 years. And I think I had a greater appreciation for what I needed to be offering those students who were on a level 
where they could have uh, done well at, at any institution uh, in the world. And I think I had a better sense of, of their needs than I would have had if I had not myself had uh, an honors program experience in my past. Did that also lead you to your involvement with the Phi Beta Kappa? You were national president of that organization for three years. What was the trajectory from your honors program through graduate school to assuming that post? In a way, I, I was Shanghai <laughs> into, the, into national leadership. Not, not the presidential uh, post, but initially I was asked to serve on one of their national committees. I thought for a year, turned out it was a three-year assignment. <laughs> and one thing led to another, and I, I got drawn more and more into the, uh, the national uh, effort because I am so committed to so many of the things that Phi Beta Kappa is, and very much in line with what we were talking about a few minutes ago about the importance of the humanities and so on. So the first thing I knew, I uh, was a candidate for the Senate, which is the uh, Board of Trustees of Phi Beta Kappa. And I was certain that since no one knew me and, and, and so on, that I would uh, have done a, a service by running, but I would not be elected. Well, I was elected, and then I guess, what, 12 <laughs> years later, <laughs> I uh, found myself uh, nominated as, as uh, president uh, very unexpectedly, and again, a very su surprising uh, uh, result. So that was another one of those cases where it was not something I had actually uh, intended uh, to do or had applied for. In fact, in, as far as uh, leadership positions is concerned, I've never been someone really drawn to electoral kinds of politics. So. Uh, an organization that doesn't engage in, in that type of, of, of process is one that I could feel comfortable with. But I was still very surprised when I ended up without campaigning, uh, elected to such a, a, a position of uh, both um, honor and, and responsibility. It's a funny story because I think those things happen often in the academy. You say yes to something and that leads you exactly. down a quite unexpected yeah. path. But let me ask you if you could back up for just a second. Could you articulate the values of Phi Beta Kappa that you think are still relevant to today's students? Why would you encourage someone to be a member? Well, I think just the emphasis on aspiring for excellence in performance is, is important. I think all too often these days, not enough emphasis is, is placed on that, and not enough value is placed on it. There are so many ways to achieve success and, and wealth and even fame without having actually uh, done anything that objectively would, would meet the highest standards of quality. It's because of, of the way the market works. There are ways to make a fortune sometimes without having excelled in the ways I'm talking about. But I think on the personal level, there, there's so much of value that an individual gains by uh, establishing a foundation that will allow them to self-educate for the rest of their lives and in this 21st uh, century climate, in, in terms of the marketplace alone, it's so important to have fundamental skills and, and fundamental uh, understandings to be able to adjust to the rapidly changing uh, nature of the world around us. And that's why uh, the liberal arts are, are so important whether you're in, in uh, the corporate world or uh, wherever, you often find that the people at the top are those undergraduate liberal arts majors because they can still understand the big picture and they can understand the way the world is going. And so that 
raises them uh, to the top, even though you'll have all those MBAs and the other people uh, floating around in, in the mix. And I just think it's important for today's students to realize that it's important to have something that you have that's your own and that you can always have that can make you a lifelong learner because that's the best way to have a sense of your personal uh, fulfillment and at the same time uh, you can uh, be a constructive part of, of society. That's a great answer and it, it's a very um it's a very enticing one for any student who, like you, is looking to be challenged, I think, and, and to really to grapple with the analytical and, the, and, the, and look for insight. I would be remiss if we didn't spend a little bit of time on, your, on the topic of your lecture here on campus. So I'd like to ask you if you could summarize relatively succinctly what effect the Obama presidency has had in the European black community. We're just in the aftermath of the midterm elections. We're seeing what's happening happening domestically. Yes. What, um, what has been the broader impact in Europe of his election? Well, first of all, it, I probably should point out that literally all of Europe welcomed his election. Uh, and it had nothing to do with his uh, race or color there was such uh, a passionate, desperate desire to have a different direction in terms of American leadership in the world because the United States is so important. And the Europeans, government and public, were so frustrated with what they felt was a very selfish, arrogant, um, me first approach by the United States and in practical terms they thought that our policies were going to drag them down and the global economy down which I think actually proved uh, in part to be the case so they welcomed uh, Barack Obama in terms of what he represented in, in, in terms of a change of direction but uh, those who were uh, in the black community and other minority communities in Europe also uh, welcomed it uh, particularly because they hoped that it signaled finally a shift in uh, attitudes by the dominant, traditional dominant Western um, publics in terms of uh, perhaps turning the page on racism and, and its importance and so forth. And in terms of the, the European black community, they hoped that some of the uh, effects of that might wash onto European shores where they felt that because they're a relatively small part of the European population, uh, not yet 2%, uh, that they felt th th their situation was sort of falling between the cracks. And they often find themselves experiencing the same kind of legacy of the past uh, consequences of, of, of racism, color, bias, uh, meaning uh, discrimination in housing, jobs, education, and, and those kinds of, uh, of things. And so they, at least initially, well, were extremely optimistic. And I'm still trying to assess where that uh, thinking is going now, as we are still in this country. So. Two years is not a long time. It's not, yes. But you are very familiar with Western Europe, not only Russia but on, the, on the far east end, but then you also have spent time in the Netherlands and in France. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, the Netherlands has become almost like a second home. I've spent in all about three years there uh, in residence, uh, differing uh, lengths of time, uh, doing a lot of, of, of research. Uh, because it, it's such a researcher-friendly uh, country in many respects in terms of the wealth of resources and uh, how well they're organized and so on. And it's a culture that's very akin in some ways to the United States tradition. You know, the United Provinces of the Netherlands was sort of a mo role model for the uh, United States of America that was founded uh, a century later. Uh, they'd broken away from the Spanish Empire, and they were led by uh, a middle class merchants, basically, and so on. And 
the United States broke away from the British Empire and had this determination to be democratic and, and so forth. Even though the Netherlands is a monarchy, technically, they're very modern and, and, and democratic kind of a, of a monarchy. Does that mean that you speak not only excellent Russian but excellent Dutch? When I practice, <laughs> I actually, uh, I, I probably speak more excellent Dutch right at the moment than the Russian because I don't practice the Russian as much. Allison, we only have a couple of minutes left, so I wanted to make sure that we got an opportunity to ask you about the scholarship that you have established in your mother's name. Your mother was Alice, I believe, yes. and she worked as a seamstress in the White Stag Building in Portland, which fittingly enough yes. is now the U of O's home footprint in Portland. Could you tell us a little bit about the scholarship just to bring this to a close? Well, when my mother died in 1983 of cancer. I was shocked, actually, to discover that she had left in her will a uh, $25,000 uh, bequest for me. And this was aided by the fact that after I left and went to college, she married. And so this was not something she had uh, put to the side based on her her career at White Stag, but I was surprised that she managed to leave anything. She was a, a lady who had only a sixth grade education, and uh, after my family had benefited from this for a few years, it occurred to me that I, I should do something uh, in her name. And so I thought I would just, because we were well off, two professionals, and, uh, we, sh we could afford to just pass that on to uh, other generations, and so I set up uh, one of the presidential scholarships, initially with just a pledge, but uh, with over five years, uh, passed the $25,000 on to that endowment, and it, I'm glad to see it, it still is, is uh, growing, uh, and I get letters annually from the, the recipients informing me of the, the wonderful things they're doing in their own uh, development. So I feel good about that. I'm sure your mother would be very proud of you oh, and very yeah. proud of the recipients of the scholarship in her name. Yes, absolutely. Allison, congratulations on your Alumni Achievement Award. It's a wonderful award. I'm glad you came to talk to us. And I wish you all the best while you're back in Eugene for a few days. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thanks for talking to us. We have been speaking with Dr. Allison Blakely, Professor of European and Comparative History, and the George and Joyce Wine Professor of African American Studies at Boston University. On November 3, 2010, Blakely was presented with the Robert D. Clark Honors College's 2010 Alumni Achievement Award. The following day, he gave a lecture entitled, Black European Responses to the Election of Barack Obama. Thank you for watching.